Hey there, listeners. Dan here. Before we get started, I do want to apologize for the audio quality of this episode. While we were recording on David's end, his audacity decided to change mics. So instead of using his actual microphone, it instead used his computer microphone. I tried cleaning it up as much as possible so you could best understand him, but there's only so much that I could do. So anyway, enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to How Did This Not Get Made? This is the podcast all about the movies you never saw or the TV shows you never saw, the scripts that were never filmed, and the ideas that never even made it to the page. My name is David Spencer. My name is Daniel Kaka. And I am Tracy. Hello. For uh, anybody who is familiar with our other show, Weird Alphabet, knows Tracy pretty well. He's been a guest on, was it only the one episode that we had you on for? Three. Three episodes. (laughs) Okay, I thought so. (laughs) I can never remember who's been on how many episodes. But yes, he is one of the hosts of the Bare Naked ABCs, which is a podcast talking about every Bare Naked Ladies song in alphabetical order. And on their podcast, I know you guys have had a chance to talk to all sorts of cool people, including, by strange random coincidence, the director of an unaired pilot of the Bare Naked <laughs> Ladies television show. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, Dan, what are we talking about today? So we are talking about the unmade television show, the Bare Naked Ladies variety show. Oh, uh, that would make sense. That would make a lot of sense. <laughs> Anyways, welcome to the show, Tracy. Thank you for having me on. This is a project that I really wish had made it to fruition. We're in the (laughs) same boat. We have gone through so many movies, television shows. We're just like, how did this not happen and it really should have yeah Yeah, there's definitely some things we've talked about that shouldn't have happened and it's good that they didn't happen i'm looking at you american red dwarf (laughs) we've only had a couple of episodes with guests so far but this is easily the biggest expert of a guest that we've had on the podcast so far thank you (laughs) now before we get into this i do want to ask you about one, your fandom and your podcast. So what led to your fandom and then how did that bleed into you creating this show? I'll kind of go in opposite to order if that's okay. You guys and the alphabetical really led to me doing the podcast <laughs> when you guys were doing Weird Al and then no one had done the same for Bare Naked Ladies and I was such a longtime fan. Beatles, Weird Al, and Bare Naked Ladies were my top three. And two of them were already taken, so. (laughs) Two of them were taken, which I was already enjoying both those shows, but was listening for a third just because I would do three-hour car rides every day, and I was like, (laughs) this cannot happen. I cannot allow this to not exist in this world. I need to find someone to do it. Then finally I decided, well, my voice isn't that annoying i suppose i could (laughs) try to do it that's the big lesson that everybody needs to learn is that like if there's a thing that you really wish existed just go make it yourself yeah in terms of when i came in to love bare naked ladies a friend of mine just after college she was a singer in a band and i was going to see one of her concerts she had to go get ready for her concert and she sat me down she's like hey Listen to these guys for a couple of minutes. I, I, I'm going to go get ready. And she put in Gordon, their first CD. Within the first five minutes, I was already just completely taken with the band. They came out with Stunt a few years later. That was my album of my post-grad years. Between Who Needs Sleep and Alcohol, like it spoke who I really was at that time in my life. <laughs> and from then, I just like started spanning out throughout their whole disc range. I know with the podcast, you guys have been, I think you guys started like, what, six months or a year after we started or something? About a year. Pretty soon after. And I know we just wrapped up this past summer, but you're in the I's or the J's? I did not realize how much music Bare Naked Ladies has. Oh, yeah. We're currently (laughs) on song 154 is what I edited this week. Oh, wow. We're not even halfway through at this point. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And they're thinking of releasing another album later this year, and we're not even covering 
the songs that they did independently Oof. separate from each oh, other. Man. <laughs> we'll be at this quite a while. <laughs> we know the feeling. Al has not stopped. He's made one or two songs since yeah. we stopped doing the podcast that we need to cover again. I can't tell anyone that the Weird Alphabet is done. It is not done. If his <laughs> career is still going, we have to. We will still get together and record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it will never be done. <laughs> yeah. Well, should we uh, start going into the story that we're covering today, Dan? Yeah. And I figure that if we're covering the Bare Naked Ladies, we should at least know who the Bare Naked Ladies are and kind of how they started. So we'll dive into that. I just want to say real quick, I know like next to nothing about the Bare Naked Ladies. I know the song <laughs> one week. And I know that the one guy was in a bunch of red versus blue stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's about all I know about uh, Bare Naked Ladies. So a lot of this is going to be new for me as well. Well, that's what a lot of people, that's all they know as well. <laughs> and that was the other reason I really wanted to do the podcast. I was like, this band is such an amazing band. And so few, especially Americans, know who they are. I need yeah. to educate America. On they it. have literally hundreds of songs. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dive in. So, the Bare Naked Ladies, they formed in Scarborough, Ontario, Canada by Ed Robertson and Stephen Page back in 1988. Wow, that's like a year before I was born. So, they've been around for a while. Even though they attended the same school together, which was Churchill Heights, they actually met after a Peter Gabriel concert, which they both attended. Afterwards, they went to a Harvey's restaurant, and they both got to talking and realized that they had very similar tastes in music. If you read their history, which, of course, I've read multiple books on their history, they intertwined with each other quite often. All six members, eventually actually ran into each other quite often throughout their childhood and growing up. The Peter Gabriel concert and Bob Dylan concerts were the two of the big ones. Peter Gabriel was the one where they met and afterwards they just kind of really hit it off. The Bob Dylan concert was the one where during the middle of the concert, they were just a little bit bored. Oh, yes. <laughs> so they started coming up with fake names of bands. Hey, have you ever seen da 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 and... Bare Naked Ladies was one of the bands that they came up with. And A favorite pastime of everybody, just shooting off random fake band names. But I think my favorite origin story for Bare Naked Ladies... Steve actually had a band before Bare Naked Ladies of just him and Gary Poonset, and they put out a tape. They shared it around school to different people. They both worked at a summer music camp, and Steve. Well, one day... Ed's walking around the camp, and Steve happens to overhear Ed singing one of the songs from Scary Music Breakfast that <laughs> Stephen had written. And he's like, where did you hear that? He's like, actually, it's from this guy. Have you ever heard this? And they immediately started harmonizing. Their voices worked amazing. And they're like, we need to hang out more often. <laughs> Yeah, before the band was realized, Ed Robertson was playing in cover band. Yep. Wait, what was the name of the cover band? Because that's what I was trying to look up. And it didn't say. It actually had three different names. And this is where you're going to stump me because I'm not going to come <laughs> up with all three. I do remember one of them was Three Men from Barry. And I can't remember the other two names off the top of my head because they kept switching names. I just remember reading that. like It was on their Wikipedia page that they were part of a cover band. And then just like that fell apart. And I was like... Well, I want to know the name of the band. I, I know all the names of my old bands. Like, why can't they put it on there? Anyway, but they were scheduled to play at a battle of the bands at Nathan Phillips Square. It was on October 1st, 1988. The only problem was the band had recently broken up and Ed forgot completely about the gig. So when he received the call confirming that they were playing, he didn't want to say no. Instead, he told them that they were <laughs> that they were playing. But they're going to change the name to, and he was like going through his head of like what names to go through. And he remembered like the Bob Dylan concert. He's like, we're the bare naked ladies. <laughs> yes, that's who we are. Now, this sounds like the episode of a sitcom. Yes. <laughs> yes. It would have been a great start to them like having a pilot for a sitcom right there. Yeah. Yeah. He then calls Steve up and he's like, um, so I'm supposed to to do this concert next week. Do you want to get up on stage with me? Because I don't have a band anymore. <laughs> and Steve's like, just, sure, that'd be great. 
three times during the week they're supposed to get together and start practicing. All three times it gets canceled and they get up there and they just start singing songs that they both happen to know and then start making up songs on the fly. Now I heard that they didn't actually attend Battle of the Bands, like they weren't part of the competition, but they were kind of like Correct. playing like the filler areas. I'm not sure if they just went to the Battle of the Bands and were like, hey, so we're not ready? Oh no, they totally <laughs> faked their whole way through it. They were like, no, we're we're my band. But while they were there, they did get the attention of one band that was actually part of the competition. It was the Razorbacks. And they were like, hey, you know, next week we're going to be playing at the Horseshoe Tavern can you guys open for us? And then sure enough, they're like, okay, cool. Now we're going to hunker down. We're going to set up like three rehearsals so that we're ready to go. And they miss them all again. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> this is one of those moments where like everything happens for a reason. Like they still played the show for the Razorbacks. And again, they just like played the songs that they knew, but they started like improvising a lot of their songs, their lyrics, which I know is actually part of, of their show and that's a staple of the show and why they are so popular it's not really just listening to their music on their albums like you don't get that same feeling but i imagine that if you went to a bare naked ladies concert and you're expecting one week and you're singing along and you realize wait a minute they just changed the entirety <laughs> of the song and i don't know what i'm listening to anymore no they keep those lyrics pretty spot on and anything that they've recorded and released, they keep spot on. The song that they change most often is If I Have a Million Dollars. They would do a lot of bantering during that song. Oh, that'd be great. It's like um, headline news. Yes. I feel like Al changes headline news every once in a while because like, you can't do news from the mid-90s. Because <laughs> the headline <laughs> news has changed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I kind of want Al to do... And Al, if you're listening, we know you are. You should come out with like once a week, just come out with a new version of headline news. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> the the weekend news according to Al. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on. Ed and Steven, they continued to play and write music together. And in nineteen eighty nine, their first album, which was Buck Naked, they recorded it using a four track recorder in their basement and bedrooms. Soon after, the band was touring Canada with a comedy band, Corky and the Juice Pigs. <laughs> Some people may recognize them because they were on the Fox TV show, Mad TV. They were the oh, wow. intro band throughout the first and second <laughs> season. I had no idea. The song we like to play for you now is a little ballad that we wrote years ago while on tour in the Yukon. I'm the only gay Eskimo. <laughs> I'm the only one I know I'm the only gay Eskimo In my tribe when the Bare Naked Ladies were in Toronto, they were actually scheduled to perform a Christmas show titled The Bare Naked Lunch. It was at this time that Ed and Steven added two new members to the band, brothers Andy Cregan, who played drums, and Jim Cregan, who played bass. The show was made into an album called The Pink Tape, which was released in 1990. And although the mix was bad, <laughs> it was awful. It was too fast. It was not mixed well. Do you have a copy of The Pink Tape or do you have like the recordings at all? I don't have a copy of any of the tapes. They are very difficult to come by, especially Yellow Tape, which has four different editions, especially Buck Naked. Like if you want to find that, you're going for thousands of dollars to find oh, a wow. copy. However, all of them can be found online on YouTube. If I had a million dollars, if I had a million dollars, I'd buy you furniture for your house, maybe a nice Chesterfield. So in 1990, Andy left the band to go on a student exchange trip to South Africa, leaving the Bare Naked Ladies without a drummer. While they were playing at Buskers Festival in Waterloo, Ontario, they met a new drummer, Tyler Stewart. They didn't just like meet this new drummer. They were doing pretty good because Ed was also a drummer. And so he would fill in for the drums and when Andy was gone. Tyler had heard them at that festival because he played with another band, but he's like, they're going to be famous. I'm going to join with them <laughs> and literally called them over and over again, showed up at their concerts and continued to harass them to get to be <laughs> oh part gosh. of the band until they finally accepted him in. That's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, Andy was gone. The band with Tyler now had won the 1990 YTV Achievement Awards and their Speaker's Corner video of the band's performance of Be My Yoko Ono 
where they all cramped inside of like this video booth. It's almost like a phone booth. The CBC, I believe it was, set up this telephone booth type situation on the corner and people could go in there and make statements, make recordings of what they hoped or what they wanted or what they just wanted people to put on TV. Well, B&L being who they were, saw the opportunity there and they're like, let's go in there and play a song. Yeah. And yeah, this video went viral in 1990 of all times. But yeah, then Andy came back and he was like, what the hell, mate? And then he shrugged it off and became the keyboardist and the conga drummer for the band. (laughs) (laughs) At first, the band created a demo in 1991 called The Yellow Tape, which was their South by Southwest performance with the intent to sell it to any major Canadian record label, but they all refused. The sales of The Yellow Tape demo really took off around New Year's of 1992. The band was scheduled to play at the New Year's Eve concert just outside of the Toronto City Hall, but Mayor June Rollins struck them from the lineup because of their name. The band didn't think much of it, and they booked a show at the McMaster's University instead. But the story of this picked up a lot of recognition, causing a large quantity of protest mail to be sent into City Hall. The band was a story of Toronto, and the Toronto Star featured a story with a picture of the band in front of City Hall. Now, the sale of the demo, Yellow Tape, also exploded because of this. And by February of 1992, they were outselling Michael Jackson's Dangerous, Genesis' We Can't Dance, U2's Acton Baby, in some of the downtown Toronto record store. I feel like I have to be very specific about that. Yeah. And these are tapes that they were making in Stephen's father's basement that he turned into his own recording studio, and they were just redubbing them and selling them to the local record store. <laughs> yes, you mentioned Stephen's dad. They created their independent label, which they called Page Productions, which is brilliant. And yeah, it did handle the distribution of this and the manufacturing of it. And oddly enough, it was one of the first ever indie albums to reach platinum status. They sold over 100,000 of these tapes. Toronto City Council since has changed the outline for booking bands to avoid further controversies. (laughs) (laughs) After constantly being rejected by multiple major labels, the band finally got signed by Sire Records in April 1992 and proceeded to record their first official album, Gordon, which featured Ined, Be My Yoko Ono, If I Had a Million Dollars, and one of my favorites, Brian Wilson. But they didn't actually get the contract until after they had recorded. Oh. Hmm. They won the money to record in a contest, took that money, and part of what they won was the ability to go in and record a album. And they went in and recorded with Michael Voyevoda and also expanded the people that were hearing them, brought a lot of people in from the Toronto music scene. When the recording people heard it, they're like, we've got to sign this guy. Like, these guys are amazing. So then in in 1994, they released Maybe You Should Drive, which didn't do as well as their first album. But they attempted to tour in the U.S., which didn't actually turn a profit, despite them appearing on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. It was at this time that Andy Cregan decided it would be best to leave the band and study music at McGill University. Also, the band was not in good shape. There was a lot of tension building up between them. With just the four of them, they managed to record and release Born on a Pirate Ship in 1996, which featured the song Shoebox, which was actually part of the Friends soundtrack. During their tour, they released the live album Rock Spectacle, in which their recording of Brian Wilson gained a lot of radio play. And I think that's usually, whenever I listen to Brian Wilson, that's usually the recording that I hear, not the studio version. So the band was starting to get big, but now in the US, not just in Canada. Their song, The Old Apartment, had a music video, which was directed by the Beverly Hills 90210 star, Jason Presley. And they also made a cameo in the movie, The Wrong Guy, and Beverly Hills, 90210. What changed your outlook? Let's just say it's not enough that I'm happy. My enemies have to be miserable. All right. Just before their 1997 tour, Tyler Stewart asked his friend Kevin Hearn to join the band and replace Andy's role as the keyboardist. Most importantly, though, at this time, they made a cameo on The Weird Al Show in which they performed their song, Shoebox. Hey, look! It's Bare Naked Ladies! 
Their 1998 album Stunt is definitely the Bare Naked Ladies most successful album with the song that most people know them for, One Week, which ironically spent one week as number one on the Billboard Hot 100. (laughs) It was at this time that Kevin Hearn had been diagnosed with leukemia, and during the stunt tour, friends Chris Brown and Craig Curtin filled in for him while he was recovering and then eventually rejoined the band. While the band was touring, they started to get more work in movies and television. It's All Been Done was used as the theme song for the short-lived animated show Baby Blues. Call and Answer was used in the film Ed TV. Their song, Get In Line, was on the soundtrack for King of the Hill. And that was actually written for King of the Hill. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. And then uh, they made a a guest appearance on an episode of Two Guys, A Girl, and A Pizza Place. (laughs) I'm sorry. What? I have never heard of this show before. Really? Really? Oh, my God. I haven't. That is is quite the title. Ryan Reynolds' first debut on TV and on, I believe, on screen at all. Hmm. Amazing, fabulous, knew from the start that he was going to be a star because he just, (laughs) he had that comic timing down. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. In the year 2000, they released Maroon and the single Pinch Me. The album didn't do as well as Stunt, but managed to reach number one in the Canadian charts, so good on them for that. The year after that, they released Disc One, all their greatest hits from 1991 to 2001. After their 2001 tour, so they took a year off in 2001, although they did play at the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. In 2003, the band got back in the studio to record their album, Everything to Everyone, which kicked off their Peep Show tour. It was after this album, they decided not to resign their contract with Reprise Records, making them an independent band again. Although they did retain the distribution contact with Warner Records, so they still had a way to get it out there. Outside of the record, the band recorded a theme song for Stephen Little Monsters and Odd Job Jack, and cameoed in the season three premiere of Charmed and performed Pinch Me, which actually threw me off. Was it during the summertime? I actually got really into Charmed. I don't know why. (laughs) Uh, We don't have to get into that. But I remember watching and I was like, That's the Bare Naked Ladies. (laughs) There's this iconic, I forget the name of the nightclub, but there's like this nightclub that they constantly go back to. And sure enough, like there they are just like as the band, but like they're treated as like, they're just a wedding band that's just playing for the night or something like that. Oh yeah. But yeah, they just showed up randomly and I was like, that's the Bare Naked Ladies. It's always weird to me thinking about bands showing up in TV shows just as themselves. Like the one I think of all the time is... Lifehouse showing up in Smallville as themselves playing in (laughs) Smallville. And it's just feels really strange and awkward. But I feel like Bare Naked Ladies is one of the few bands where all of the actors have the personality and like the screen presence to actually make it not be that weird. Like there's still that moment of, oh, I recognize these guys from stage, not from movies, but they seem to be able to fit in on screen a whole lot better than a lot of other bands. Yeah. Like <laughs> you reminded me of Third Rock from the Sun. It was like near the end of the show. And they're like, oh, and welcome to the stage, which by the way, they're only in their attic. Because they all, like, yeah, they live in this this attic area. Right. And they're like, all right, and coming to the stage is Elvis Costello. <laughs> Where the fuck did he come from? Oh, yeah. It was the time when there was the most random musical appearances on stage. Like, Beach Boys were doing Full House, and, like, every show was doing it at that point. Yeah. yeah. The Weird Al show and all that. Yeah. <laughs> Weird Al show. That at least had a premise. Like every week it seemed to be a, a new musical group that would come in. That's yeah. true. Even Weird Al did that with, uh, what was that show where he shouts slime at a kid or that, oh, yeah. that TV movie? Like that's another instance where she's like Weird Al as himself mm-hmm. for some reason. Although he, he kind of works with every cameo. It's like, <laughs> yeah, what's that yeah, one? Yeah. It was an HBO cartoon where he, like these two characters are walking through the wood and just like, you're multi-Grammy award-winning comedy artist Weird Al Yankovic. What are you doing in the middle of the woods? <laughs> <laughs> the Bare Naked Ladies, they're now an independent artist, and they created their own label, Desperation Records. And they released their second independent album, Bare Naked for the Holidays, which eventually would lead them to perform for the variety special Dennis Leary's Merry F***ing Christmas. But yeah, that was in 2005. It eventually goes there, but we have a few things to cover in between 2003-2005. 
But we're not here because of Dennis Leary. We are here specifically for the Bare Naked Ladies variety show. Also 2005. Yes, also 2005. The reason why we have you on is not just because you are a Bare Naked Ladies fanatic and a expert in it, but you actually had three dedicated episodes to this pilot. So how did that come about? Who did you talk to about this show? I will be honest that it was completely a throwaway in the dark at the point that it was going to happen. I had been working (laughs) for two years at that point to get someone to come on from the show. And we'd already had Steve at that point, but I didn't know the show even existed when I talked to Steve. But then I was able to secure Brent Carpenter, who was the director of that show, along with a million other projects I soon found out in Hollywood. Yeah, look at his IMDb, honestly. It is just incredible. And of course, he also was the producer for most of Ringo Starr's documentaries that he did in videotaping his concerts for the last 20 years. And so that was quite the honor talking to him about Ringo Starr as well yeah. as yeah. Bare Naked I Ladies. actually, uh, I recently watched Almost Famous yesterday, and I feel like his position with Ringo Starr is that he's just like following him wherever he goes, just recording and talking to him just about music and everything, just like following his life essentially for for years speaking of band members who can fit in well on television shows (laughs) exactly (laughs) so yeah i talked to him about his very storied career even at that point and he's done more since but at the same time somehow and I, i don't remember how i managed to wrangle him in but i was able to also secure an interview with harlan williams now of course harlan's done a couple of different things with bnl between doing the cousins with Kevin and doing the music video for falling for the first time and also doing the bare naked ladies variety show. I feel like you need to explain the cousins really quickly (laughs) for those who don't know the people who don't know Kevin and his cousin Harlan Williams, who grew up together for a long period of time. Harlan's idea was just, just create this band. Most people would think it was a comedy band based on BNL's history and Harlan. Harlan Williams stand up, but no, it's very serious. Some of the songs are funny, but The Clown is probably one of the most heartfelt and depressing songs that you'll ever hear, but at the same time makes you want to re-listen to it. Cause he's a clown, he's crying on the inside. And they put out this whole album of content and they actually, Harlan said last year when we talked to him that they're actually working on another one. So I'm really excited to hear that. And I do recommend that if you haven't listened to those episodes already, they're really insightful. Like they go beyond just this pilot episode, just beyond the show and like going into the career of Brent and what he's done, especially with Ringo Starr is just amazing. Do you know the timeline of when he was brought on to the project? He was brought on to the project just after he had finished with Greg the Bunny. Okay. It was such a weird (laughs) show, but like I loved the first season of it. And this is at the time where like Fox was canceling a bunch of shows that would eventually become successful. I believe that this is around the same time that they also canceled Family Guy. They're like, that's not going to go anywhere, right? Yeah. (laughs) That was Fox's big mistake time when they were just like, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. We're going way too far out on the edge with these comedies like Greg the Bunny and Family Guy, Bare Naked Variety Show. Because they did that, I think they lost out on a lot of good chances. Now, I tried looking into where the origins of this came from not everything was too clear on what actually happened so but from what i could find the story that i could find was that there were two executive producers it was ann manny and kara welker so they bumped into each other at a concert didn't actually mention what type of concert it was or who was playing there i imagine (laughs) it was bare naked ladies because if you're at a Bare Naked Ladies concert, you see Bare Naked Ladies and you're just like, we should put them in a TV show. But it didn't confirm that. It just said that they were at a concert together. While they were at the concert, they were both fans of BNL, and they were like, we got to put these guys on a 
TV show. Like these guys are wildly entertaining on stage. Like there are hundreds of people at this concert. They're really enjoying them. And BNL already has a relationship with Fox. Like they did two guys and a girl in a pizza place, 90210 and King of the Hill, all of them Fox properties. So they're like, perfect. They're going to fit right into this. They also did Ballad of Gordon, which was a PSA back in the late 80s that they did for them on alienations and racism <laughs> on kids TV in the morning. <laughs> and then there was me, you didn't even know me, but you treated me like dirt. And then there was me, you didn't even know me, but you called me a jerk. And then there was me. They eventually got together and they figured like, well, we can make a TV show with this. And what was the last successful television show that featured a band? The Monkees. So why don't we make a variety show like the Monkees television show? And sure enough, they collaborated together. They put together a pilot. And by January of 2005, they actually filmed the pilot episode. Who wrote the pilot? Jeff Schaefer and Alec Berg. They were main writers on Seinfeld. And then Jeff Schaefer went on to write Curb Your Enthusiasm just after this. Oh, okay. Also kind of makes sense that you would jump from Seinfeld to Curb. Yep. <laughs> and it's also how he brought in Michael Richards for this yeah, pilot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Alec Berg would then go on to write The League. Oh, oh cool. There is a 17 or 18 minute pilot depending on which link you follow or find. I, Go to the 18-minute yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> I will include in the description a link to the 18-minute episode. It was leaked online. You can definitely tell, like, it even says, like, not for distribution purposes. <laughs> it's definitely made for executives to look at and decide whether or not this is going to actually be a show. Or, like, because I worked at Warner Brothers, we actually had a season. It was, like, right after pilot season, we actually had a screening. It was, like, a whole week of just screenings where they would actually bring in focus groups and actually watch these pilot episodes, and all of them would, like, jot notes down. I remember the year I was there, the pilot episode for Disjointed had just come out and one of the guys who came out of the screen was like that was the worst television show <laughs> i've ever seen and somehow it still got a full season it seems like this screener was made for that specific purpose the person that leaked it online was brent carpenter the person who directed the episode oh they couldn't release it on youtube so it's on vimeo it took me years of searching for it to find it because you can't search Google and find anything on Vimeo. You have to actually go on to Yahoo to search to get Vimeo results. Interesting. I imagine that if it's the director who leaked it and they're like copyright strike and he's like, I'm the director. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. It does give me a little bit of joy every time we're watching something for this podcast and I see that message of like, ha, I'm not supposed to see this. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now, we're gonna actually going to go into the breakdown of the pilot episode in just a bit, but I just want to get your hot take. Tracy, the very first time that you had seen it, which would have been two years ago, oh, one year ago. I watched it probably five times in a row just because I loved it so much, especially the Michael Richards scene. <laughs> I could not get enough of that scene and the privacy scene. There were jokes in there that don't land anymore, especially in our Me Too culture. The whole Gazongas line and, <laughs> and being a womanizer, especially if you're a fan and you know that he's married, like that just yeah. falls apart really badly. It reminded me of a story I heard from Bernie Burns at Rooster Teeth. And of course, Ed Robertson has been on Red vs. Blue and they've done a bunch of stuff with Rooster Teeth. And I remember, I think it was Bernie Burns telling a story on one of their podcasts of being out to dinner with Ed and somebody coming up to him and saying, hey, you're you're on my freebie five list. And this person <laughs> was being serious about like it was the type of thing. It was like, oh, ha, ha, that's great. I'm so great to meet a fan. And then she stood there and like was expecting something. Oh. And it was like, oh, no, this is uh, that's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. <laughs> anyway, so all the scenes of him being a womanizer just made me think of that story. <laughs> I think in the especially in the aughts. 
it was a good pilot for that period of time. And I'm really surprised that it didn't get picked up by Fox or at least someone at that point. Cause that's when cable started to really spread its wings and have multiple directions. It was going, I mean, I could have seen this working on comedy central or something like that. It was outlandish enough and edgy enough, especially the opening scene with the mountain goats and the wrestling goats. Like <laughs> I would have loved it. And I still go back to it and watch. It. I watched it twice again this week and was, laughing hilariously so <laughs> i have to say i was not as into it i didn't think it was bad it was the kind of thing where it felt of its time it really felt dated to me there's a lot of the kinds of gags that they do in there that have been done over and over again since and there's definitely some gags like making a whole thing about him liking wearing women's pants that it's like is this really funny enough to like spend four scenes on but there were some <laughs> things that i really enjoyed i really enjoyed the bus driver and his whole knock on wood shtick i love that like they were being really clever with playing with format with the commentary thing and also like the way they went from one shot to the other in there or the commercial break song like I love that they had a lot of clever ideas and I think the fact that they had all those things I imagine that if the show was produced they would kind of lean more on the weirdness and less on the sitcom situations of being into the agent's assistant and those kind of tropes that I feel like have been done a million times before because clearly they've got like these wacky ideas to do something a little different you know it's almost like how community you know got so much weirder in the second and the third season once they had found their footing i would imagine that the same type of thing happened there so it, it was a type of thing where it's like i could see where the potential was but most of the jokes were not for me well i could see there were definitely swings that missed and yeah some of them were like totally 2000 tropes you had some amazing writers writers that just came off a very very big show if you go and watch pilots they can be some horrendous <laughs> things yes and still get picked up that this didn't get picked up i was like oh but it could have been so much better like it would have found its footing eventually yeah it felt like with the pilot episode, there are moments in there where if you just kind of let the guys go and do their own thing, they were funny, they were entertaining. But like when you get to the point where you have to kind of force the story into the situation, like you can really feel where their chops are lacking. Like these guys are not actors. They're performers, yes, but they are not actors. <laughs> and it's even something where they even acknowledge it. it was uh, Ed was like, Oh man, I was really wasted in this scene. He's like, you don't even drink. Oh, well, I'm, I guess I'm just a bad actor. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because I feel like he's actually the best actor of the group yeah, of them. I feel like they really leaned into that. So they kind of notice, and I, I feel bad for everyone else who's in the bad. They realize like he's the best looking and he has the better chops <laughs> acting wise. And it felt like if he's on stage he can interact with everyone he can interact with the band but it felt like a lot of the story just started to like lean into him and it's so reliant on him and then on top of that him being a womanizer as well and they're like well it doesn't make sense if we give this part to anyone else they're just going to seem creepy but if we give it to you it's going to be somewhat believable but because he's not that person and he really doesn't know how to channel it one again not an actor which i don't blame him for not being able to do this with that being thrown on him and so much weight on him, it's so hard to make an ensemble when you're leaning so hard on one person to carry that narrative. Yeah. He's not an actor, but the other part about that is like, he's an extremely faithful husband when he's doing that other role of this womanizer, you can see the discomfort like rolling off yeah. him <laughs> in those scenes <laughs> It just feels wrong. <laughs> it feels like he's kind of doing this on purpose, being like, I know my wife is going to see this. I don't want yeah. her to believe that I'm into her. Yeah. And in doing so, he made all of us not believe that oh, yeah. he's not into her. <laughs> yes. and, but Tyler, like, even though his lines are creepy, you believe him. This is Tyler's personality just totally coming out. <laughs> Let's actually dive into like the breakdown of this pilot episode. And if you haven't watched it, I recommend doing so just to like see what you th you think about it. I originally watched the 17 minute pilot episode. You sent me today 
the other one you're just like oh this one includes the opening scene that wasn't included in the 17 minute episode and it starts off as a behind the music (laughs) episode about the bare naked ladies and then it goes into like but what really brings together is their love of goat wrestling united by their love of playing music and their passion for goat wrestling we don't like goat wrestling. Come on, it's aerobic, it's erotic. You know you're tempted. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> and they use the movie announcer. Yeah, and they're even interacting with the narrator as well. And they're just like, yeah, you know, just take off your pants and just go at it. And just like, <laughs> yeah, this is definitely, ooh, I honestly would have maybe preferred it. And I think like, had this actually been picked up, they probably would have worked on it more. I think they would have just started off with the concert. And I think that's, where the appropriate place it should have gone. They recorded 10 different types of openings for this show. Oh, wow. <laughs> this was the last one that they recorded. And even then, Brent said, we knew it didn't work. Whatever it was, was not working. Yeah, I think them starting off with like, it's a Bare Naked Ladies concert. This is a band. This is what they're known for. They're playing music. Like, I think for me, like, that's the perfect opening. Even like the behind the music one is really interesting. It's just like those scenes just don't really like, they're like magnets trying to repel from each other. (laughs) And it just doesn't feel like it, it fit as well. We're at the concert. Which should have been the opening. The show starts off with the band performing their theme song in front of a crowd preparing us for what's to come which is a real concert sort of yeah they brought in like a few hundred not like extras but they were like actual fans that they called them out and said like hey if you're a bnl fan come on in we'll pay you to listen to your favorite band (laughs) for three hours for three hours one of the people that was actually at that concert like posted what his experience was what they did for the order of the songs his thoughts on what the orders of the songs were throughout the whole thing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when they kicked him out (laughs) and then literally the ushers pushed them out the door. We get a few interesting lyrics in there. The one that really sums up what the show is going to be about is it's not what you're thinking unless you're thinking that it's really weird. Yeah. Everything else is kind of like, just kind of i don't want to say fluff or filler because it's like it's there as like this is their personality but like i really think that those lyrics really boiled it down even the strongest song that they do during this pilot episode once again going to that monkeys feel like we're gonna throw some stuff in here but i feel like they had last minute had to kind of come up with the songs the commercial break and the coming back from commercial break are much stronger than the opening song. Although there are a few lyrics in there that really made me giggle. They're like, find out which one is married or are all of us gay. <laughs> <laughs> which is definitely around that time, like boy bands were around. And, they were just like, and I think like Ricky Martin was, people were getting suspicious of him. And they're just like, but this is around the time that like people were getting more comfortable with coming out. The band finishes the song, which then goes into them being backstage. They discover that Steven is wearing women's pants. And where he bought them from was the International House of Pants and Bras. He's made fun of for it. The band sings an impromptu song about him wearing women's pants like the yeah it's a funny joke but it it definitely lingers on it it also was weird to me because i feel like this is at the time of bands wear girls pants like i mean i guess that's more of like emo band type thing but i feel like there was definitely an image of like rock stars wear girl pants and that's just what they do and so it was just like strange it was a weird thing for like the rest of the band making fun of him and it's mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. don't all musicians just kind of wear weird things anyways but yeah. uh okay <laughs> well i think that's yeah. what they were trying to poke fun at yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah got them size 14 ladies jeans that's enough thank you <laughs> so their manager comes in because the imdb just only lists the band members who is the actor who played the manager he looked really familiar and I couldn't place him. That I don't know. What I do know is that the person who plays his assistant is Sly Stallone's girlfriend at the time. Oh! Because oh. Brent Carpenter said a lot of people were hitting on her and people kept coming up to these people that were hitting on her saying, you don't want to do that. You're not, <laughs> no. You're, no luck. <laughs> now, Ed has two reasons as to 
not make it believable as to why he's not into her. <laughs> yep. I gotta convince my wife and Sly Stallone. I really actually liked the agent character. I thought that was a really funny way to do it. And like, kind of the idea that they were just like at the mercy of this agent's whims of wherever they were going to stay and however they were going to perform. I enjoyed that quite a bit. Great show tonight. You make me proud to be a manager. Hey, Pierre, what'd you think of the new arrangement of Shoebox? I don't nice to see the show. Great shows are something you say, like, uh, I'm sorry for your loss, or, of course I'm not married. As far as the character goes, he's pretty great. I kind of wish that you saw him manage other bands, because it seems like he's only managing the Bare Naked <laughs> Ladies and is making bank off of them. <laughs> and it and they're riding this really run-down bus and yeah. staying in run-down motels. I think it would be great. Like, leave his personality leave his character the way it is but i would love for him to be like oh he's actually managing a big band at that time maybe like <laughs> he's managing j-lo right now and then the bare naked ladies are really just an afterthought to him he's like i don't know let's just get some random bus to like get you around <laughs> and whatnot had it been workshopped i think you could have added that element to it he's in there it's implied that ed and uh, his assistant had hooked up maybe before hi ed Hey, Kiki. Ed discusses with the band that he's going to eventually ask her out. And then Kevin informs them of the publicist, Linda, that dumped Ed. And then we cut away to a sign that reads, Bare Naked Ladies, <laughs> Lie, Cheat, and Suck a Giant Pile of Ass. <laughs> that, I think that might have been my favorite gag of the whole pilot. That was pretty good. <laughs> that was amazing. And this is definitely like, has that family guy feel to it but it like it works so well and i i really yeah. enjoyed that the manager comes back from his call he informs the band that they have a gig on the day that they were supposed to have off for the month but the manager is going to take a day off instead of them i'm jumping ahead we never actually see the gig and i think this is why the pilot episode kind of fell apart for me because it didn't seem like they were going to achieve getting that gig or having to play it begrudgingly it didn't feel like it was going to lead to that moment to realize like it was an awful thing or like had it been that their gig was actually the japanese wedding that would have been hilarious that would have been amazing so i think had that been the case i think that would have been the thing to do and for him to get like that sleazy motel off to the side and be like i couldn't book you in the hotel because the wedding, they took over the entire hotel, so I had to send you to the next best thing. I feel like that would have helped tie in a lot of things because it just, <laughs> I don't know, it felt disconnected to me. And I think that's why it didn't work. So we only have 18 minutes. And back then, shows were at least 23 to fill in the commercials. We're missing a good five minutes. And we don't know what happened to it. Brent doesn't even know where it went and can't find it, which... I'm hoping that, like what you said, because it does feel very abrupt and it doesn't feel like this story arc is brought around. Yeah. yeah. Who knows what happened in the last five minutes? So the next morning, the band is leaving their hotel apartment complex. I don't know. They're like outside of a building. <laughs> it doesn't look like a hotel. This looks like a place that they live. Giving them the kind of monkeys feel of like these guys all live together kind of thing. But this does bring in one of my favorite gags, which is Kevin with the Zignon 5. It's a little early for that, Kev. Sorry. It's definitely one of those gags that's been done plenty of times before. But like, I really did enjoy it. I think you mentioned on your podcast, the Zignon 5 is not real. It's not an actual keyboard. And then they bring it back for their Snack Time album, for their kids' album. Hello, I am Zignon 5, and I like my blue chips. And I never got that line until I, I watched the <laughs> pilot, and I'm like, oh, that's where that comes from. Oh my goodness. They were really banking on the show actually taking off. and <laughs> That also seems like one of those kinds of jokes that is like 
very much comes from the band of the idea of like the band member who has that one weird obsession with the musical instrument that they're in love with. That's the kind of joke that feels like it was something they added in. And I feel like is one of the reasons why it works really well, because it does feel like it comes from the musicians. Oh, and that is totally a Kevin thing. (laughs) Like Kevin is totally in love with his instruments and having a whole bunch of toys to play with. Oh, for sure. (laughs) I can see that every single instrument, that he has and he's got to be measuring in the hundreds at this point that he has probably a name for every single one of them <laughs> I think you're spending a little too much time with that keyboard cap it's creepy don't listen to them take not five the band's outside Kevin did his thing and they're complaining about the gig and Stephen reminds him of that horrible TV show that they were talked into. (laughs) I believe that they're implying that this was the horrible TV show that they were forced to do. Remember that horrible TV show he talked us into? No, no, no. The the other one, the, the sitcom. Jim gives Steven a look like, dude, don't put the show down. Like there's a, if you look at the background, Jim just turns and gives Steven this look of no, don't go there. <laughs> and he's like, no, not this one. <laughs> I love good self-deprecating humor. I, that felt like a very like 30 rock thing of always referencing how terrible show they are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but then we cut to another show that they were forced to do, which is called Making It Happen, in which you see them with a broken television. There's a hockey puck in there. I'm realizing how much this show feels like so similar to 30 Rock in so many ways. They also had a fake sitcom called Making It Happen as a throwaway joke in an episode. Oh, that's hilarious. I don't think anybody stole from anybody. I think just Making It Happen is a pretty good generic sitcom name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but the big reveal is that George Takei is their father. Dad, it was an accident. Tell it to your mother. Oh, no, you didn't! I couldn't figure out who the mother is in it, but she's great. And I can't figure out who that actress is. No, but she's been in a ton of things, and I wish there was an IMDP page that listed everyone that was in this. Yeah. You boys are in quite a bit of trouble. You simply cannot play hockey in the house. George Decay always giving 110% to even the dumbest little bits that he has. <laughs> Next, we see probably one of my favorite characters, Hilt McGinty, who's played by (laughs) Harland Williams. I think you're using that phrase incorrectly. Knock on wood? Now, see, I disagree. That's the way I always use it. Knock on wood? No, see, it's an expression of hope. Like, I've never crashed a bus yet, knock on wood. Now, that there would be a flat-out lie, son. We transition to footage of them performing near and far. was a staple of their concerts during the maroon tour was that was a bit they would do at every single show Mm. so i imagine like the executives have seen that and was like we need to get these guys on a television show if they're that entertaining on stage we gotta put that on tv which is one of those things where like if you're at the concert it's hilarious on television it has a different feel to it yeah Oh, wait, I didn't mention, like, Hilt McGinty when he's, like, loading the bus. He's just, like, throwing <laughs> all of the luggage and whatnot. And he's, like, not even looking at all. Just missing the, oh, missing the completely. compartment. It's so good. Yeah. And everything about that character works so well. If this show had gone on and he wasn't reoccurring, I would have just not watched the show. Like, <laughs> now, give him a show. Like, oh. I want to see a whole... <laughs> Okay, give him a show. Every episode is a different real-life band playing themselves, and he is just the bus driver for all of these different bands. I want to see that show, knock on wood. (laughs) That's the pilot we should have gotten. (laughs) So the band's on the bus. The topic of Steven's pants comes up again, uh, but now he's in man pants and realizes they're not as comfortable, and they proceed to sing about it. Where's the crime in loving women's pants? Well, you're not a chick. You've got... Guys! I don't know why they keep going back to the joke. It just doesn't... I don't know. No. Because somebody doing something that isn't stereotypical to their gender is funny. That's why, Dan. (laughs) It's so funny. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. 
Tyler informs everyone that he needs to take a shit. Then Kevin points to the sign that reads, if it's going to cause a fuss, do it off the bus. <laughs> Which, again, seems like a thing that came from the band of real life experiences. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then something that confused me, it's Hilt McGinty when he introduces himself. And then he gets up out of the driver's seat and talks to the band. They're like, no one is driving the bus, but they called him Hoot. Howdy, Hoot McGinty. I'll be driving you to your next show. Hoot! We're going to have to make a pit stop, man. It's like they didn't get what his name was. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love that gag that he just like stands there and he's like, well, there isn't going to be a restroom for the next 60 miles. And they're like, should you be driving the bus? Yeah, yeah never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and that was actually filmed live. Like they were driving down the highway with that in the background <laughs> rather than doing a green screen. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. They had a real driver in there behind that little curtain off to the side. I could tell like there was that curtain there. I was like, by its angle, you could definitely tell like someone was definitely driving the bus there. But I do love the gag that he just like gets up and he's like talking to the band, (laughs) even though he's supposed to drive. So yeah, they pull off to the side. Tyler goes behind the bushes and the band asks him like, hey, Tyler, do you need anything? In which he says a little privacy, in which the band then breaks into the privacy song. And doesn't give him (laughs) privacy. I do love this gag that they actually come up behind him in the bushes where he is at currently. Oh, yeah. And it's, uh, they get it's a whole so choir funny. around him, like. Privacy. I got to have some privacy. Yeah. I love it when someone goes <laughs> really outlandish with a joke like that. Like, how far can we push it? You have to suspend your disbelief as much as you do with a musical, per se. Be like, yeah, like all of a sudden, all of these people are so well coordinated and know this choreographed dance. How is this happening? <laughs> <laughs> Having that suspension of disbelief it, like made it so much funnier. Once they get back onto the bus, who reminds them that he can't drive past dark because of his license? <laughs> <laughs> so good. And then the names that he comes oh. up for them. Hey, fog hat. Count Chocula, Johnny Jingle Nuts. Let's shake a leg. My license doesn't allow me to drive after dark. Come on there, Telly Bun. The first time I watched that, I had to pause it because I was laughing so loud. <laughs> like, Harlan Williams had me on the ground laughing throughout any part that he was in. He's so good. But then they, soon after that, cut to the commercial song. Where we all learn about special products that we need to make our lives better well it's great because it's making fun of the fact we're going to send you to something that you're supposed to be buying but was it really worth it (laughs) my favorite bit is like to buy things that'll make your life better better Better? i guess yeah better (laughs) (laughs) and then we have the we're back song are you considering consulting your doctor you just skip all the commercials because you got tivo we're back we're back now had this pilot gone on Do you think that they would just keep those songs in there and just kind of like just repeat them over and over and over again? Or do you think they would try and re-record a go-to commercial song, a We're Back song for every episode? (laughs) That's a great question. I would like to think they would come up with something new for each episode with the coming back from the commercial song. I think if they were planning on doing something for every single commercial break and it was going to be the same thing every time, it would have been a lot shorter. (laughs) (laughs) My guess is that they would have probably done a series of songs. Like maybe the reason why that crowd was there for three hours is because they were trying to do many different intro and outro songs so that they had different varieties like they would eventually get repeated but you don't want to hear the same one over and over and over and over again so i think they may have done like different variations of it so that they could cut them in so that might be the reason why i'm actually looking through the song listing right now to see if that's in fact what they did they did a lot of banter That I can imagine. (laughs) There is a song in here that did not make it into the show that they must have recorded for a future episode if it was going to happen called Silent Nuts instead of Silent Night. That was going to be for the holiday episode. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Nope. They only recorded one version of the coming back from break. All right. They did a song called Pick Up the Pilot also. So... (laughs) I imagine had we seen this entire pilot episode, that would have been the end credit song. That would have been amazing. 
So we're back in the bus. They're playing cards when all of a sudden we get the side-by-side commentary with Ed and Steve. I was pretty drunk when we shot this scene. You don't drink. Yeah, you're right. Wow, I am a bad actor. Which is great because Ed doesn't drink. Like, that's Ed being totally truthful. Yeah, we see that with, like, Weird Al as well. We need a drink. You don't drink. Yeah, but I've been meaning to start. (laughs) (laughs) I love that the fact that they they point out the stunt double. They're like, see? He's wearing an earring. That's how you can tell it's a different person. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's a corny gag, but I love it all the same. (laughs) There are jokes in here that like really land well, like that joke. And then there's some like ladies pants that don't. No. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They get to the destination. I love that we see Ed and Steve. They're like, oh, well, the scene's over. So let's get out of this booth. And then they actually appear from out of the bus, (laughs) which I actually had to rewind to see where they were in the scene before because they were in the card playing scene. And then when you cut to the side by side, like it's a different shot. It's showing the other members of the band. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty great. It's one of the things I like about this pilot, but I love about that you get in Deadpool much later that breaking the fourth wall like how much can we break this still keep it believable but be funny about that yeah <laughs> i think that fits in really well i like that. yeah and this yeah. is i think uh, when did fx start doing like where they presented movies but they're like dvd on television and they showed like behind the scenes or like oh. director's commentary oh i don't know about this i remember when like x-men first came out that was it like was a big thing time. yeah So I think this is, if it's 2005, yeah, I think they were trying to go off of that, of like the DVD on TV thing. So the band arrives at a nice hotel to find out that they were booked at the uh, Schwenke Diggs, which is run by Michael Richards. The lobby is filled with clocks, much like Back to the Future. We get another Kevin Zignon 5 gag. Kevin. Sorry. It's not you, Zignon 5. It's them. But then we see Richards with his favorite clock because it can stop time. Yes, this one here is my favorite. I can utilize this one to stop time. Like so. Yeah. Did you feel it? No. Well, it's because you were stopped. This scene is interesting and upsetting (laughs) i love the premise of like oh yes this can stop time but you wouldn't know because you were also stopped i'm not sure how i felt though after it had been going on for a minute and just all the talk about making love with everybody i was like okay especially it being michael richards i was like i don't i don't know how i feel about this right now (laughs) well it went to creepy and then it just kept going so it's like that's that. true so it like almost went like went so far that it went past it yeah, oh, yeah. for me it went past it because <laughs> the first time i was like oh now i'm getting creepy vibes and then it just it kept going and then in the next scene it even keeps going to where he's looking out the window at the band and i'm like all right yeah you guys are really <laughs> want to push that to that level although one of my favorite yeah. parts is like Wait, were my pants unzipped? Seriously, does anyone remember my fly being open? All right, everybody, hold still. (laughs) That was good. That was good. Great. And then we get the end. They all come out and they call the manager and he's like, oh, you're complaining about groupies now. (laughs) (laughs) They see the hotel that's across. They're like, we're going to stay there no matter what. They tell the receptionist that they're the band, and you can definitely tell that this receptionist, which we've all been in that situation before where we're dealing with customers and we're just like, all right, <laughs> have it your yeah, way. I, I'm not going to fight you this are the band. it's not worth my money. <laughs> There's yep. a whole subreddit called like, not my job or something like that. Where like, <laughs> not my pay grade. People just, yep. yeah, people just comply with the manager no matter what. Like I remember this one story of, it was a guy who had to paint a bridge or something it was like a small bridge somewhere and he refused to do it on that day because it was really windy if you're painting something when it's really windy paint flies everywhere and his manager was like if you don't paint it you're fired and he's like all right i guess that's what i have to do and surely enough after he was done painting the bridge there was a parking lot down below covered speckled in paint from the bridge and that company had to cover the cost of the damages oh, that were done oh because goodness. of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely one of like, you don't know what's going on here. 
but sure. Let's see yep. what the worst that could happen. Yep. <laughs> I tried to warn you. It's like, all right, let's get you changed. And they're like, change? Why do I have to get changed? Which brings us to one of my favorite gags, but also one of my least favorite gags. Yeah. Because <laughs> they... it, it does not age well. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I assume that this is a Japanese wedding. Well, it sounded like they were speaking Japanese, and George Takei is Japanese. Yes, But is. the look of everything is very Chinese. Well, it's because they filmed it in a Chinese restaurant. That would make sense. Oh, okay. But even like their <laughs> outfits, did they just borrow outfits from um, I don't know, like... <laughs> <laughs> but those are real instruments. The reason I love this scene is those are real Japanese instruments that the band learned to play to play that song. Oh, that is pretty cool. Now, I know that they change up the lyrics a bit and they actually start speaking in a different language. Is it Japanese that they're singing in? I don't know, and I, I, I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. dare hazard to guess. <laughs> I'm not even going to guess if it was really another language or they just <laughs> randomly was gibberish. said gibberish. Yeah. I realized I didn't mention what song that they were singing. So they actually, with these instruments, are playing One Week, in which we know that when the lyrics in One Week is Chickity China, the Chinese Chicken. Sorry. Chickity China, the Chinese Chicken. Chickity China, the Chinese Chicken. Chickity China, Come on, the everybody. Chinese Chicken. Chickity China, the Chinese Chicken. In which they <laughs> emphasize it. It's okay. not just like one of the other lyrics. This is like, this is the lyric that we need to focus on. In which it kind of is funnier if like everyone starts getting more and more upset at this band. Which... Yeah. They're like, see, we're playing to our audience. And you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Again, I don't know why, like, so much of this show reminds me of 30 Rock, but it also feels like the way Tina Fey writes jokes about race in her shows, where it's like, I can see what you think you're trying to do, but it's not really working that well. <laughs> Although the uh, Chinese chicken joke does pay off because Tyler gets hit with a piece of chicken. Which I assume, yes. <laughs> because it's a Chinese restaurant, a piece of Chinese chicken. <laughs> well, and they hold up a Chinese chicken in the middle of that oh, God. sequence. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, was, I noticed that. Yeah. The guy, you guys are really hammering this home. You know what you're doing. There's a moment where the chef just kind of looks at it and is like, oh, oh yeah, they're like, we're, we know what we're doing here. We're doing this on purpose to be outlandish. <laughs> so the song ends. Everyone is appalled. The father of the bride, he is seething. He is angry. And then you see George Decay, and they're like, George Decay, you know us? You can vouch for us? He's like, I don't know who these people are. <laughs> I love that George Decay is just randomly there. He gives him the thumbs down. He's like, no, no. And it's such a great callback to earlier in the episode. Like, yeah. It definitely pays off. Now, this for us, so we had seen the 18-minute episode i did not include this part on here because tracy i'm gonna have you take over for this this is all that we saw now obviously this is not the full episode because it is only 18 minutes now what did we miss what did you find out from your interviews with brent so when i talked to brent and i recommend people go out and listen to that interview as well because absolutely really is both that one and the Harlem one, like they gave us such amazing interviews. I had to do very little talking because they just did everything. <laughs> so what happens next that we don't get to see is I guess it breaks out into this huge fight, which you would imagine would happen at this point. <laughs> and it was filmed because they had the actor that plays the father doing this huge like karate kick. But then one of the wires that he's supposed to be on breaks. Now, was that actually scripted in it or was it like? Yes. Okay, so it was scripted. Yeah. So it's like the third Austin Powers. Isn't this magical? One of my wires broke. He's just hanging there and the band walks out and just pushes him out of the way as they walk by. <laughs> that doesn't explain five minutes worth, though. I still feel like something else was missing at the very end of this and he couldn't remember what it was because there's still the gig that they have to play on top of that. So, and I like your idea. I really wish that had been the ending. That would have been amazing. So from my guess is that if they had played this gig in order for them to stay at the hotel, they get past the angry father, which I imagine would only take like a minute 
to do that. You have four minutes now. Okay. So we have to then explain the gig that they're going to. They are taking over a band's hotel room who was already hired to do this show. So I imagine that there's going to be conflict with the actual band that was supposed <laughs> to be there. So there's going to be that whole mix up. And then they have to go on to do the gig. And what I want to happen is that they said, okay, well, we took your gig. What if you took our gig and we can finally get our day off? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I like the idea that that was the actual gig that they were supposed to do. And when he said I swanky too. Gigs, I really do. he really did mean that they were going to be staying at a really nice motel. And it just <laughs> happened that across the road was this other hotel. There are certain jokes that they left hanging that they could have, I hate to say it, still brought back up. I mean, the rule of threes comes in with you only have them doing the Zygnom 5 twice. You know there was a third one coming. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, Kevin was actually playing whatever Japanese instrument that was. But it actually said, and I believe that they changed the language on it, they somehow like maybe phonetically spelled it on there. But like you could see the five on there. So I imagine that they wrote either in Chinese or Japanese. I'm sorry. I know. I know. I know. But I believe that they translated it to say Zygnon 5 in whatever language it was supposed to be. That in. is amazing. <laughs> Wait, did you not see that? Did Dan and I notice something in the pilot that you didn't notice? I did not notice that. No, because I, I saw didn't. that too. And I was like, oh yeah, it's like the Zygnon 5 thing right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you got an excuse to go watch it again. <laughs> I have to watch it again. Yeah. Yes. Well, and they also didn't come back to women's pants which was a joke that they'd done twice at that point it needed the third to finish it off i even as much as i didn't like the joke if you're gonna do it twice you have to finish it with that third yeah it needs to end with steven accepting the fact that he's just gonna wear women's pants because they are far more comfortable and then if he buys women's pants for everyone in the band and everyone's like you are right. These are <laughs> yeah. comfortable. Exactly. That has to be like the end line because that's what started the episode. Like, mm -hmm. And then it wouldn't feel as creepy. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know like with our hot takes, like with David and I, I feel like our distaste towards this pilot is because it feels like a lot of things did not pay off. Yeah. Yeah. And had it been for those five minutes, most likely it would have. <laughs> And they wouldn't need a closing song, too. So, I mean, I believe that these writers are smart enough to do that. And I feel like we just kind of left at the end of Act 2. And we're just like, well, based on the first two acts, it's pretty terrible. But with the third act, it could actually be something that's that's pretty decent. So I, I got to talk to the director, but I've also reached out to both writers. I don't know if I'll ever hear back, but I'm hoping that the fates allow me the opportunity and maybe they have hidden somewhere the actual script. We know you're listening, Jeff Schaefer and Alex Brooks. <laughs> we know that you want to give us this information. Prove to us that this was a pilot worth picking. <laughs> and if you don't want to prove to us that it was worth it, then don't do anything. So balls in your court. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of the run. That was the end of the pilot. And from what I saw, like, because in their Wikipedia, it felt like it was just like this blip in their career of just like, oh, they filmed a pilot and that's <laughs> it. It feels like this was really just another gig for them to do. And they just, they went forward. And the next project that they did was the Shakespeare's As You Like It, which they wrote and performed music for the play, which was performed at the Stratford Festival of Canada, which I believe they put out as an album as well. Only for the people that went to the play during that run. And that's it. You can, there's only like a thousand copies out there. Oh, oh wow. So yeah, it feels like they just went on to the next gig and they're just like, well, we got paid to do a pilot, didn't go anywhere. And then they broke up three years later. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I looked into Bare Naked Ladies' involvement with like movies and television shows. And for them, that's really hard for something for them to escape. And I imagine that they are collecting residuals like none other for what they did. <laughs> oh. Like on the same level as like they might be giants. Well, for Big Bang Theory alone, they get tons and tons of money. I have a list. This is a a fraction of what they've done <laughs> of either things that they've either been a part of, like either written music for, or their music just happens to be featured in it. So I have 
Coneheads, D3 Mighty Ducks, 10 Things I Hate About You, American Pie, Drive Me Crazy, Digimon the Movie, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, that's the 2000s version, they sing a song. Little, David, I know you love that movie, (laughs) and Flight. That's just to name a few. On television, they've been featured in Party of Five, Spin City, The West Wing. I remember that. They were in The West Wing? Or just their music or them? I believe it was them. Why is The West Wing, why is the President of the United States getting some band from Canada? From Canada! (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, (laughs) do you want to continue that list? Because I can't wait for that. What's coming up? Let's finish up the list. Scrubs, Veronica Mars, United States of Terra, How I Met Your Mother, Some Jerk with a Camera, (laughs) Supergirl, (laughs) Mr. Robot, and of course, like we mentioned before, The Big Bang Theory. Oh, and you did miss one. This is the one that I was waiting to hear. Okay. Because, David, your statement about why would the president bring in some Canadian band? They were also on The Apprentice. (laughs) Oh, Oh, boy. (laughs) My favorite story of that is that when he saw the band, of course, he made his comment that you would expect him to make about the band's name. (laughs) He's like, that's not who I thought was coming to my show. But when he met the band, they had just released Pinch Me. They had just released Maroon and Stunt just before this. So they were big at this point. Mm -hmm. It was a thing for Apprentice to get them at this point. And they were bringing them on as like the final chapter challenge of the season like raise big money using these bands i don't remember what the other band was that that was also raising money his response was this will be big for you guys yes <laughs> oh. so <laughs> about that hmm. i guess to bring it back to more sane things i think the favorite mention of mine as far as bare naked ladies go they didn't appear in it their song wasn't a part of it but the fight that they have in community about the bare naked ladies. <laughs> yep. This is a fight. We are fighting. <laughs> oh, they're B and L now? They're B and L. They're that essential that we need a cute nickname for them. <laughs> okay, Jeff, you are clearly in a bad space today, but Pierce is our friend, and the bare naked ladies are triple platinum. Are you? Especially the idea of Donald Glover like rushing to defend the bare naked <laughs> ladies. But yeah, that was the Bare Naked Ladies variety show. They uh, eventually went on to do the the Christmas special. They did Dennis Leary's Christmas special. And the thing that I want to really go back on, the Monkeys television show. The older one, not the new Monkeys. Yeah. No, not the new one. <laughs> but the older one, and really, why did that work? Why did that show work? And part of it is that the Monkeys were not an established band first. The Monkeys came out of the television show, whereas Bare Naked Ladies were an established band and then put it into a TV show. So for the Monkeys, these guys were actors first. They were actors that could perform. Like they were manufactured and put together. And you could really mold them in the exact way that you wanted to. So if you took something like the band, the Bare Naked Ladies, and then you held auditions for people to do that. Like if you need someone to be a womanizer and you're realizing that Ed isn't working, but you need Neil Patrick Harris instead to take over for that role, (laughs) it probably would have worked a lot better. So I think that's the thing that we really need to look at. And if you're trying to compare the two of them, it's really unfair if you And I think that if they had done that, the joke that immediately pops to mind is, of course, having them on there as a different band, that a competitive band in some kind of like Battle of the Bands or or some sort, where they do the thing where they make fun of themselves and everyone gets the wink and the gag. It doesn't surprise me at all that Fox didn't pick this up considering they were in the time where they weren't trying anything new and canceling all of their weird original stuff. And it seems like if this did get picked up, it would have been canceled after 10 episodes because that's who Fox was in this era. Fox was done taking chances and just canceling everything. Yeah. It would have been interesting to see what more they could have come up with if if they had that chance. But the Bare Naked Ladies went on. They wrote a couple more albums, wrote another theme song. So, you know, they, they did okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honestly, if you want to be entertained by the Bare Naked Ladies, like, well, I, I mean, you just can't see them in concert anymore. But if you can find concert footage of them, they're 
wildly entertaining. Oh, yeah. And they're great. Especially when Steve was with the band. Like, the chemistry between Steve and Ed on stage was amazing. It really was what made people want to go see them in person. Yeah. So I think this variety show was just... It was a weird mold that they tried to put them in, and it's really difficult to try and package them that way and not really trying to play to their strong suits. Like there are little moments in there where they're like they really stand out and they're it's really strong as far as like jokes go, as far as some gags go, but like uh, you were trying to fit them into a mold that really wasn't made for them it's a really good experiment though and it definitely showed some really cool things <laughs> i'm glad that it exists yes that, i yeah. will say that i'm glad that it's out there <laughs> absolutely absolutely I, I agree with that anyways well thank you so much tracy for being on the show with us no yeah. thank you guys for having me of course i'm glad course. we were able to make this happen if people want to find out more about what you got going on where's the best place they can find that well the best place to find us would be at bowlingstormtrooperentertainment.com or you can just look us up wherever you get your podcasts downloaded. Uh, we're on all of those servers. And hopefully by the time this is released, we will actually have our Patreon up and, and running as well. All right. And hopefully you guys will be on for a discussion of Bare Naked Ladies when we hit one week. Absolutely we will. Yes. 100%. Oh, yes. I mean, you guys let me come on to talk about Jerry Springer. I mean, it's only fair. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And you can find more episodes of this podcast by going to our website, pipedreampodcasts.com, where you can also find the full archive of The Weird Alphabet, as we talked about earlier, and find Tracy Como's episodes on there. And you can also find Come On for Who pods and escape from vault disney as well as other stuff you can also send us your emails not get made at gmail.com you can find us on social media we are on twitter at hd t and gm and on instagram at not get made well thank you everybody again for listening and we'll see you next time all right thank you it's been one week since you looked at me Talked your head on the side and said I'm angry Five days since you laughed at me Saying get that together, come back and see me Three days since you live in the room I realize it's my fault but couldn't tell you Yesterday you've forgiven me But it'll still be two days till I say I'm sorry